Hello, one today. It's Thursday, August 3rd, 2023. And this is the week in charts. I'm sure I thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Thank you very much. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I'll have a lot to say about that, as I normally do. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks and crypto picks. Hold off on your stock and crypto picks until we get to the live charts. We'll start with crypto first, and then we'll look at stocks, and I'll let you know when that is. And if you don't mind, one stock at a time, and then hit uh, carriage return. Carriage return? How old am I to say that? <laughs> they still call it that? All right, so what we're going to focus on, well, how to shave fifth, five to 30 years, maybe 15 years, off of your learning curve. And it's actually a lot simpler than, my, than you might think. And I got an email last night, and that'll make a little more sense in just one minute. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can have between now and then. Okay, letters. We do get letters. Good evening, Dave. Thank you for sharing the books below. Your service and courses have been tremendously helpful and very grateful. Thank you. I have learned a lot from your books and videos, which I have put into practice. Two things I'm struggling with and the reason for revisiting your methods are a proper way to pyramid a profitable position and when to close a position for profits, i.e. fixed percent profit target, three times a stop, break of a lower channel, lowest low of past 20 days, break of 20 day moving average. Taking losses become automatic by placing stop loss orders with the broker next day, and then I trailing stops in step function way, trailing them with a manual stop orders a daily close basis, initial stop loss minus six at 6% 6 profit move and manually break even at 16% move stop to loss to 12%, et cetera. I'm reviewing your materials and hope it will help me design a profit taking algorithm, which I can implement with confidence. In other words, continue raising stops as the position advances or three exits, one stop loss minus eight, raise to minus four, zero percent profit, four percent stop, ten percent profit stop, or profit target twenty percent. Try continuous trailing stops placed in broker system and experience too many stop outs. Step functions, stop orders seem to work better for me than continuous trailing stop in the system. Whew. Okay. Well, lots to break apart there. So before we get into the weeds. I want to talk a little bit about understanding how markets really work. I saw the word algorithm in there, and that makes me a little nervous. And I guess some of the stuff we do does have a bit of an algorithm to it. But when I think algorithm, I'm thinking more complex programming. Now, unlike coin flips, markets are not normally distributed. So a lot of the things he was talking about were fixed percentages. And you can't necessarily use fixed percentages when it comes to the market because markets don't adhere to fixed statistics. And, and statistics are worthless. 74.5% of all people know that anyway. Now, for instance, a fixed statistic or if a market or some places, let's just say uh, something is normally distributed, then you could say if X, a certain criteria, then your edge is going to be 2%. If you're flipping a fair coin, obviously it's gonna be 50-50, there is no edge, but at least you know it's gonna come up heads half the time and tails half the time. Now casinos, obviously not on the one-armed bandits, but with a lot of their games, their edge is really small, especially when you get into the really high stakes gambling. And although the edges are super, super, super tiny, they know they're gonna win over time. It, they have to, that's, that's statistics. That's one case where they're not worthless if you have something that's normally distributed. So they've built multi-trillion dollar businesses just off of very, 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 very tiny edge. In fact, if you had an edge that always works statistically in the markets, you should mortgage your house, you should borrow money, you should steal some money <laughs> and, and just dump everything you own into the markets. And obviously that's a bad idea because they're not normally distributed and you'll never know exactly what your edge is all the time. Doesn't mean that you can't make money trading longer term, but over periods of time, you never know exactly what your, when your edge, what your edge is going to be. And that's one of the issues that we run into a lot with trend trading, but that's really with any type of trading. Now, if the market adhered to statistics, and if you think about that, the firm with the biggest computers and who knew the most about statistics would make the most money, 
thereby eradicating the markets altogether. Once they started pushing their edge, they would just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and eventually it would just wipe out the entire markets. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Now, you got to realize that we're dealing with emotions and we're not flipping coins, okay? And I know I'm taking a long way around to get to my answers for Mr. Cal, but we're going to get there. So just stick with me. I want to get some things out of the way first. So again, there's no fixed statistics when it comes to the markets. I, I wish it was just for me though, but <laughs> but there isn't. So that's, you know, what's the purpose of getting into a hypothetical uh, discussion? Now, one thing I wanted to flesh out a little bit, and this is something that we could flesh out in, in upcoming weeks, is because this presentation just kept growing and growing. You want to seek to qualify, not quantify so much. So I, I have what I call trend qualifiers and not trend quantifiers, although some of them can be quantified a little bit like Landry Light. You can say, oh, we've got 20 days of Landry Light. Maybe we have a trend, but you still want to look at that trend and qualify it by saying, okay, is it accelerating? Is it persisted? Does the stock trade cleanly? Are there gaps and laps in the direction of the trend and not against the setup itself? And so on and so forth. All the things I talked about in my books and often in these webinars and occasionally in seminars. I don't know if I've spoken since uh, COVID. <clears throat> I used to get out a lot. Now, years ago, Dick Fruit told me a story. And Dick Fruit used to be a broker back in the 70s, and then he became a money manager. And he's been a money manager, I guess, the last 30 years or so. He's over in Houston. Super nice guy. Anyway, he told me a story about back in the day, people didn't trust the S. Well, there wasn't an there wasn't a SIPC. There was no securities protection, so a lot of people actually held their shares. And I should have grabbed a share of stock. I don't think I have any handy. I used to have them on the wall in my old office. New office is so small. Anyway, I collected uh, quite a few of them just to kind of decorate the old office. It was kind of cool, and they're they're absolutely beautiful. You get them canceled on eBay for virtually nothing. Um, I have stacks of them around here. I could send you some, but it, it'd be cheaper for you just to, to get some off of eBay by the time I pay shipping and all. Uh, but anyway, but if you really want one, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll dig something out for you. Anyway, he would, he would chat them up. He, he worked at the office and he had a lot of, uh, how did, how did he say the word? Commungeons, you know, it's like old farts, you know, the back of the office who would most of the time would just yank the shares out of the person's you know, hand and sell them and do whatever, give them a ticket and send them on their way. But Dick's much more gregarious. He's a super nice guy. I've actually spent time with him over in, in Houston. Just a just a wonderful guy. And he would chat him up a little bit. And he's like, well, why are you selling? And they would say things like, well, I'm getting married. Or, you know, womp, womp, I'm getting a divorce. Or maybe they'd be happy about that. I don't know. <laughs> Depends, I guess. He's buying a house or maybe retiring. Maybe there was some unexpected expenses. Maybe there were some expected expenses. Like right now, obviously, inflation's hitting everybody. Economy slowed a little bit. You know, maybe you might have to sell those stocks. Who knows? Maybe grandpa croaked, you know, and we got to divide up the shares between the kids and so on and so forth. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is what is all that? have to do with trading nothing absolutely nothing so my point here is cal was kind of saying some statistics was hinting at statistics and an algorithm and things like that well how could you reduce all of these things to an equation maybe as a collective you could come up with a trading system as i have plenty of those obviously and I have some discretionary methods to use for trading pullbacks and stuff. And maybe as a collective, if a lot of people are selling due to the economy or for whatever reasons, then maybe that it will put pressure on the markets. Now, Tom McClellan gave a really good speech a few years back. It's probably been 10 years now. Jeez, it's been forever. In New Orleans at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting. And 
I told him that I was quoting a lot of the things he said and a lot of things he was talking about. He was talking about a, a stock versus a commodity and how a stock really has no in use value. And Marion, uh, who else uh, was talking about that? Mike Moody talked a lot about in use value too in one of these speeches. Anyway, I was quoting a lot of things that Tom McCullen said about a stock versus a company and how you're not actually buying the company, you're buying a piece of paper that represents shares in that company and you have to worry much more about the other people who bought it before you than you do the company itself in general the company is working hard to there's a few things that happen you know that the who was it a hewlett packard or whatever you know a, an ex soft porn star was working for him and uh the ceo and he decides he could chase her around the desk and turns out she wasn't too keen on that and they got into a lot of trouble. But as a general statement, companies don't all cook the books and they don't all try to chase the secretaries around the desk and so on and so forth. In general, they have the shareholders' interests, your interests, and mine. But like Tom said, your bigger concern is everyone who bought the stock before you. And he said, and those people will screw you. So we went back and forth with a few quotes. And he goes, well, I've got another one for you that's that's really good from his late mother, Marion. And I've heard this quote many a times since. It's very, it's probably one of the most popular quotes about trading. Everyone uses timing in their investing. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money, while others use methods that are far more sophisticated. I think uh, the original quote had far, and that's why I said that. So the point I'm trying to make is people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, and occasionally they might even have something to do with the actual market. Now, again, you might be graduating and need some money, or you might have did something you shouldn't have done <laughs> and need half your money, you're giving up half your money. What's the, uh, I tried to marry my ex-wife once, but she found out that I was after my money. <laughs> Anyway, death, taxes, and all kinds of other crap can uh, really affect what people are buying and selling stocks. Now, the bottom line is, no matter why they reach or how they reach their conclusion, it all boils down to supply and demand. And as I often preach, and as I have printed on my right arm, uh, except I have uptrend, downtrend, and sideways, but there's either demand, there's either supply, and the other state is equilibrium, demand equals supply. You'd be surprised how many people forget that a market could sometimes go sideways. Everybody's so caught up in, hey, is it going up? Is it going down? Well, sometimes it goes sideways, and that would be equilibrium. That's where demand equals supply. There's not a whole lot of economics that really work when it comes to stocks, but the most basic economics of all, and I think in a presentation prior, I did a little demand supply curve thing, that actually does work with stocks. They're either going up, down, or sideways. Now, it might not be what you want it to be, and often it won't be, but you always need to ask yourself, which one is it? And you can't be Bill Clinton in this. In this. What is, is. I guess all you young guys probably don't remember that. He, would, he was, <laughs> he was uh, using the Chewbacca theory to confuse the people who were interrogating them and um, he said, it depends on what the definition of is, is. And lots of people's head just kind of exploded. <laughs> Chewbacca theory. Chewbacca defense. Now, one thing to realize, and when you get into charting, is supply can create supply and demand can create demand. So some dude is looking at the market and it's going down and the big blue arrow is pointing down. And he starts thinking, you know, my retirement's getting ready to suck if I lose any more money. So he says, F it, I'm out. So that in and of itself could cause more selling pressure. And then let's say the market's headed higher and you're not in, you might start feeling some FOMO, fear of missing out, and you might jump in and you and other people like you dogpile in and that can create a parabolic market. Nobody wants to be left behind. I'm starting to see a little bit of that, at least before this last correction happening. And 
I'm wondering if the microcosm that I'm seeing or what I'm seeing is a microcosm, I should say, is maybe something bigger to where when this market corrects a little bit, as it has, eventually the buyer's going to step back up. Now, we did have some bad news yesterday, and so far the market hasn't completely shrugged it off. We sold off on it, and we kind of stabilized a little today. But I do think if we take out that yesterday, day before yesterday's high, that would be Tuesday's high, I think it's going to be really good for the market. We'll get to that in just one second. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the trader's journey. And I think I sort of these trader journey things before I learned about the hero's journey. So you'll probably notice that influence in here too. And the hero's journey and the trader's journey are kind of one and the same. And maybe I'll go back and, and do some of the, the hero's journey. And I forget the guy's name. It's it, it escapes me at the moment. If somebody knows it, let me know. And if you're not live, write it in the comments below. But anyway, he talks about the hero's journey. And there's a call for adventure, and then you reach a point of no return, and then you end up back where you started after a, quite the adventure. So a trader's journey begins with a little bit of confusion, and that confusion increases, and then eventually you start reaching enlightenment. Now, what causes the confusion is you start adding indicators. And then you start adding more and more indicators. We all start with a blank chart, unless your charting package has some kind of template set up and you just immediately click on it and start using it. But for the most part, we all start with a blank chart and then we try to figure out what's going on. And then we think, well, we just start throwing some indicators on there and that's gonna help. By the way, indicators derivative of price. So that's why I'm such a big price purist. Now I do use some occasional indicators to help me out a little, mostly just a moving average that's pretty much it and then historical volatility for a measurement of um volatility <laughs> to know how volatile stock is anyway you add more and more indicators and then at some point you begin to study the complex and arcane and the reoccurring theme that i see quite a bit and it seems like this is something that cal might be doing a little bit of is reinventing the wheel and i'm glad I need to check my emails. He, um, he seems familiar. I, I seem to remember him from years back. And I think he's revisiting my stuff now. So hopefully hopefully he's ready to simplify things and, and just follow along. But anyway, you got to be really careful when you find yourself studying the complex and arcane and reinventing the wheel. And trust me, we all do that. But if you don't go home with anything thing tonight, it's just realize that if you could minimize that, maybe just spend a year doing that, okay? Get it out of your system. Then you can come back to learn how to trade properly. And obviously, when you get stuck in that maze, you end up on a holy grail hunt, which does not exist. If somebody had the holy grail, they would own the markets. And when dealing with human emotions, like I showed earlier, whether people are getting divorced or married or buying a house or selling a house or whatever, there's no way to factor all those things in. You're not on the present, right? You can't do that. So anyway, this whole process that nearly everyone seems to go through takes about five to 30 years. And I'm not joking. I've had people email me for 20 years now you know as, as i was going live i'm like should i say that that kind of makes me look like a bad teacher but obviously if they're still working on trading systems and never bothered to actually try mine and follow it to a t not that i'm the grand poobah but they're they're emailing me and asking me for help so i assume they want to do what i'm doing then where am i going with that <laughs> That you, you, so at some point, you got to get out of this maze. And, and again, I know I've got a few people that email me for over 20 years. And in some cases, I've actually literally cut them off and started giving them some tough love. And you, and, you, and I know I'm getting older. It's like I tell my wife, it's, it's becoming like a superpower. And she's five years younger. And she's starting to understand, too. It's kind of like, you don't feel like doing something? Just say no. It's like I'm becoming a crotchety old fart. But... <laughs> <laughs> I don't find myself doing a lot of things that I don't want to do. Family obligations aside, obviously. Hopefully my family's not watching, which they don't. <laughs> anyway, 
So you got to be really careful not to get stuck in that maze. And you may never come out. If you get bored, see if you could find the grail through the maze. So at some point, you begin to remove the indicators. And as I've said many a times before, and next time somebody says we want them, definitely going to screen capture it. But a lot of times people will send me a, a chart with so many indicators on it, I can't even see the, the price underneath it. And, and that's our ultimate goal is to figure out what price is going to do. And the way you figure out what price is going to do is you look at price. But the true enlightenment comes when you begin to remove more and more of those indicators and you end up with a blank chart. Years ago, John Bollinger had a forum. And like all forums, it turns into Lord of the Flies. And, and he asked me to rejoin it a few years ago. And I think I did, but I never did get into the reading the stuff. But anyway, years ago, it was really popular with, with a lot of a lot, a lot of people. It was kind of like the who's who of the trading world. And I was honored that John would 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 ask me, little old me, to, to be part of his group. And like most forums, it becomes Lord of Flies. And that was my big fear of my trading. What's uh, Dave Landry's Trend Trade? It's my Facebook group. But so far, it's been fantastic. And it's been a really good group. I think part of the reason it's a good group is we're qualified and we have similar interests and we all want to obviously make money in the market and none of us are out there to try to look smarter than the other guy. We're all trying to accomplish the same goal. Maybe that's why it's worked so far. Knock on wood. Come in. I guess I need a new joke. <laughs> anyway, long story endless, at the bottom of his byline, or his byline, I, I guess I would say, when he posted in this forum, John would write, if you dance far enough, you arrive at the beginning. And I, and I emailed John and said, John, I really like that quote where'd you get that so i could because i'd like to borrow it and he said well he was watching a documentary on albert eiler and uh john's really into jazz i tried i tried putting on an albert eiler uh jazz station on pandora for my office i figured something like that maybe be good to work with you know i kind of i'm kind of a headbanger i like all kind of music but i'm a bit of a headbanger and i can't be cranking up slipknot in the middle of the day <laughs> Um, and that gets in that yeah, you can only listen so much of that, then you got to listen to something a little more mellow. But anyway, he said, based on this, uh, well, I, I just can't do an Albert Parler, it's like a um, I don't know, it's hard to describe it. It's going to be a big insult to Mr. Eiler if I try to describe it, but it's uh, I think it's an acquired taste. Long story endless, uh, John said, well, he got it out of that uh, documentary, but the 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 genesis of it was likely a T.S. Eliot quote. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all exploring, we will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Well, that's your trader's journey right there. When you stop trying to overcomplicate your trading and, and come up with a bunch of algorithms and all these things. And, and yeah, you know, maybe grail hunt is a hobby on the side, but then trade something like Landry-like pullbacks and use like really simple money management, like I'm gonna rush through in just a second to kind of make a point. And then if you're successful with that, then by all means, knock yourself out and go on your grill hunt, but keep it simple is the bottom line. Curtis Faith, I get a lot of good stuff, or I've gotten a lot of good stuff out of Curtis Faith. If you go to davelearn.com slash books dash two dash read, he's got two books there I recommend. Trading from the Guts and the Way of the Turtle. Uh, I don't want to go off that turtle tangent, but I said I would never read those books because <laughs> I thought they were dumb trying to make money off the turtles. But Faith was an actual turtle, and Faith actually gives you a lot of good insight into thinking about trading. So definitely read the Way of the Turtle. I mean, there's there's a bunch of takeaways from that book that I that, that I. Uh, that I could think of, like one for instance is uh, Dennis was okay, uh, Richard Dennis was okay with them losing money, of uh, losing open profits. In other words, open profit drawdowns. And that's that's kind of a big deal. And, and it's okay to give up some of those open profits. And I'm gonna show you a trade here in a second. We gave a lot of open, open profits, but we still did okay longer term. And the thing about the open profit drawdown, just in case uh, he's watching is, a, friend of mine from the gym, younger guy, he's getting into trading and he's looking at the prop firms. And these prop firms put these 
these trailing stops in on your drawdown. So let's say you're up $1,000, and if you hit $1,500 drawdown, you're out, and you have to reapply for a for an account or or give them more money. Let's say you go up $1,000 in a day, but you don't take those profits because you're riding that trend, and then it goes back down to zero. Even though net net, even let's say you make 100 bucks, okay? Let's say net net, you're up 100 bucks, so that's a good thing, right? Unfortunately, that $900 that came down, they bumped up your drawdown $900. Now you can only lose $600. And I could see where that would squeeze you out of a trade really quick. And I know I'm, I'm digressing, but I just want to kind of throw that in. Getting back to the simplicity of trading is, it, 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 getting back to Mr. Faith, it takes a lot of time and study before one realizes just how simple trading is. Amen. But it takes many years of failure before most traders come to grips with how hard it could be to keep things simple and not lose sight of the basics. It usually takes about 55 to 30 years. <laughs> now, one thing that I was reminded of in looking at this email is the knowledge gap. And I did this presentation, I think for Trading Simplified, not that long ago, and I do a, um, I do a segment on psychology there called Mind the Gap. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I just did it a few months ago, but I think it was in March or maybe last year, last December. But anyway, on a losing trade, a knowledge gap will lead you to believe that if you knew more, you could have avoided the loss. Now, I didn't talk to Mr. Cow, but based on his email, it seems like he feels like he's searching to try to fill that knowledge gap. Now, once you have a conceptually correct methodology, and by that, I mean one setup and some money management and a little discipline to follow it, okay? Those three things. And I'm gonna give you those two out of three tonight. And I'm sure we could, we'll, uh, we could talk a little bit about psychology too, if you want. But once you have a conceptually correct methodology or even one setup, all you need is one setup to be successful. Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. I agree with Linda. Stress over a knowledge gap means that you are assuming that, a, that there is a holy grail which does not exist. So once you have a little experience, and like I said before, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. And then one guy's like, ah, I'm going to prove you wrong. And so now I have to kind of adjust what I say. I was like, okay, I'm not successful. And I've been paper trading. It's like, well, how long have you been paper trading? It's said, two weeks. I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> that's not long enough. Not like a contract of two weeks, which seems to go on forever, but literally two weeks. So assuming that you do have some experience and you're wondering why you lost on a trade, maybe there is a knowledge gap, okay? Maybe there are some more things you need to know and, and maybe you just need to be pointed in the right direction. Cal kind of strikes me as an engineering type based on the way his he's like searching for these formulas and trying to quantify things and all. So I feel like he's got a little bit of a knowledge gap there, but that knowledge gap could actually be filled when he stops doing that searching and just starts kind of looking at markets. Are they going up? Are they going down? Where are the setups stacking up? Which stocks trade the cleanest? Which stocks are accelerating? Which trends are persisting? Which have the nice, fairly deep pullbacks? Which ones are Landry light -like pullbacks or bow ties or some other type of setups? So with a lack of experience, obviously you will have a knowledge gap and that could actually cause losing trades. But you can close that knowledge gap fairly quickly. You're always learning, okay? And uh, what is it, uh, Encora, Emporo, or something like that, whatever Michelangelo said allegedly when he was 80 years old, I am still learning. Now, sometimes you just have bad luck. It happens, okay? And it could be a statistically valid loss. But Dave, you said statistics don't matter. Well. Hear me out. I mean, I know that if I pick really good stocks every now and then, one of them is just going to fail. But longer term, I'm going to catch the occasional home run and make it all work worthwhile. But yeah, you're going to have 
statistically some losses thrown in. In fact, I would I would rather be right all the time. Okay, as I've said before, I took a personality test. I have a problem with agreeableness. In fact, it's a sickness. I had a not a not a heated debate, but I, I mentioned something to my wife earlier about a television program, and she's like, "I should know. I've watched it." And blah blah blah. And I'm like, I actually got on the internet to prove my point. Whether or not I will use that knowledge, I don't know. But when that episode comes on, maybe I will casually make my point. I don't know. <laughs> it is a sickness with me, and that's what that's that's what makes trading so hard for me. And that's why I work so hard at it. And that's why I probably have an educational business to constantly remind me that I will be wrong. But anyway, the point I was going to make is I would rather be wrong a lot the majority of the time and make a lot of money when I'm not wrong, when I'm right big. I would, in other words, I'd rather be right big and not incredibly accurate, okay, than more accurate and not make money. And many people do just the opposite. They're shooting for accuracy. Well, if you get in something, you risk two bucks, okay, and you take one dollar profits, you're gonna be pretty damn accurate. But it's going to have a what's the uh, word negative expectancy. You're gonna you're gonna wind down doing that because you're losing twice as much as you're winning. Unfortunately, the flip side doesn't work either, like he was alluding to earlier. And the reason that doesn't work is you're twice as likely to get stopped out. So you got to be really, really careful. And I'll reiterate that in just one second. So you need to avoid knowledge gap angst. Now, I talk a lot about the post-mortem. And one thing I've been working on lately, and I'm up to probably a thousand pages, handwritten pages on a book I've been working on forever. But I'm always preaching about the post-mortem, like, okay, you take the trade. And then win, lose, a draw, you go back in and you back the chart out to day one and you look at it to see what you see uh, without any hindsight, okay? What's there without hindsight? Well, I often talk about like time travel, okay? You look at a setup and you're like, okay, this setup is really good. Time travel to the future and imagine how you feel, how'd you feel if you lost money on that trade? If you could live with yourself, then take the damn trade, okay? If you can't, then don't. But where I'm going with this is one thing I'm working on is the pre-mortem, and that's kind of where you write your post-mortem first. And you say, I I took this trade, blah, 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 blah. Here are your reasons. And basically, your, your pre-mortem should be your post-mortem when all is said and done. And I'll I'll have a lot more to say about that in upcoming presentations. Now, another thing that I've worked on quite a lot and I talk about quite a lot is extraneous influences. So let's say that person we mentioned earlier brought the shares in, let's say he wants to do some trading. Well, all of those things that are happening were extraneous influences and those, all those things still influence us as traders, okay? You have a, a fight with your spouse, significant other or both, okay? Then it's gonna be, it's going to influence your trading. And sometimes you might, I'm guilty as anyone, you know, I'll come in here like, I'll show her. And then, you know, and then it becomes, she'll never know. <laughs> but you got to be careful. Uh, recent trading can really affect you, boredom, et cetera. When I'm printing money, I get a little careless. I got to be really careful. When I'm losing a lot of money, I get sometimes a little super cautious. And sometimes I get a little sloppy because I'm just trying to make something happen. And you have to really, work hard to separate all those extraneous influences and by the way it all comes back to documentations documentation documentation documentate your life document your life easy for me to say and document of course your trading every day i wake up as i've said quite a bit excuse me <coughs> <coughs> looks like i grabbed the vodka by accident um <clears throat> that was a joke. <coughs> document your trading, obviously, but document your life. Uh, as I preach, I wake up every day really early and I write three handwritten pages and then I go off and do my other writing about 
the extraneous and all this other stuff that we've talked about earlier. <clears throat> but if you could do it, few people can. I've I've told I, I shout it from the rooftops. I tell everyone I meet, do your morning pages. And very few people do it. If anybody here does them, let me know. If you're watching this on YouTube, let me know if you're doing them. But get up and write three handwritten pages. It could be, I'm tired. I don't know what's going on. The markets are kind of crazy. I lost money yesterday. Maybe today I'll be better. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Just, just start getting all that shit out of your head. And believe me, it'll change your life. And just little things before I digress too far. I know, too late. But it's like, you'll write, write down what you're worried about. And amazingly, six months from now, you're going to reread that. And you're like, oh, yeah, that happened. It's no big deal. Eh, I dealt with it. Or 78% of the time, it doesn't even happen. Now, greater fool hunting, that's something I've also talked a lot about. Anytime you buy a stock or a crypto or whatever, you're expecting a greater fool to come along and, and give you more money than what you paid for, okay? Well, you always need to ask yourself, am I the greater fool? Anyone ever get the high tech? Yes, we, get, we often get the high tech, and it sucks. It is what it is. That's why we wait for entries. We put our entries above the market, and sometimes that keeps us out of trouble, but sometimes we still get the high tech. What does the other guy know? And assume he's smarter than you, okay? Assume that maybe he has inside information or whatever. Why would he sell it to me? That's the question you need to ask. And like I said before, years ago, my father-in-law, they were, her and uh, him and my mother-in-law were, uh, they were interested in gold and silver. And I, and at one point in time, I helped them buy some gold and silver. And they weren't using any timing whatsoever. They just didn't like what was going on, I guess, geopolitically or whatever. So another story altogether. But I remember when gold was finally in a position where they should buy it. And so I figured it would be my duty to tell them, hey, you know, I know you like buying gold. Now's the time. My father -law kept saying, why would they sell it to me? And I'm like, because uh, they're in business and they make money. They mark up the gold that they sell you. And. You were a successful businessman. You retired early from your business and you did really well for yourself. You don't understand how business works. And he kept saying, why would they sell it to me? And it's like, oh, you know, he's got a point. It's like on the radio now, you're hearing all these ads out there. Why would they sell it to you if it's going to go up higher? Like Larry Williams said a while back in one of his presentations, they, they are convinced that gold's going higher, but they sure want your dollars for their gold. Think about that. So anyway, you're the greater fool, I guess, for those guys. Now, of course, you have to do the brutally honest post-mortem in every trade. I don't like doing post-mortems. <laughs> if the trade works out, I feel like a genius. I don't even worry about it. But you need to do post-mortems. Now, this is where you go back and say, what's well, the setup really that great? But here's where you save yourself a lot of angst. Coming into the setup, you ask yourself that, okay? Is it really that great? Yes, it's fantastic. Or why is it not fantastic over here? You got to be careful, as Annie Duke calls it, resulting. You got to be careful not to use resulting as whether or not you did the right thing. You made money. Did you do the right thing? Mm, maybe not. Okay. And the other question to ask yourself in the postmortem is what are you seeing now that you should have saw, should have seen, I guess, back then? If it truly is a hindsight bias, which is akin to a knowledge gap, then chalk it up to it happens, okay? So a hindsight bias will lead you to believe that the information you now know was there all along. There's a book, and I don't think Kahneman wrote it. What's his name? He wrote, he wrote Liar's Poker and all those other ones. But it's called the Undoing Project, and and I wish he'd have gotten a little deeper into it that 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 he did. But it was a good book, nonetheless. And basically, we have this propensity to think that what we know now we knew all along, and a lot of times we beat ourselves up because we now know something, and that's a hindsight bias. But was the setup really a mirage? Were you reading into it? Was it a setup mirage? Was it really that great? Was everything you thought was there really there? That's where you have to constantly work to improve yourself. 
But if you did everything right, just chalk it up to shit happens, right? Now, pre-mortem, that's what I was talking about a second ago. I took this trade because it lists all those reasons. Write that pre-mortem first. So if you write your pre-mortem, you take you take you write your pre-mortem, take your trade, and you post-mortem just as basically a photocopy of your pre-mortem, right? Should be at least. Now he was asking about pyramiding. And in the last episode of trading simplified for stock charts tv i talked about the wisdom of jesse livermore and livermore in chapter 10 and some other chapters too of reminiscence of a stock operator was talking about pyramiding so i guess if you're a big huge trader and you're trying to put on a hundred thousand shares or even five thousand shares and a higher price stock or whatever livermore says don't go in all at once go ahead in and pyramid now what he's saying is okay first you want to wait for the price to break out or whatever method he was using seems like he was using breakouts but he says don't you know you're not going to buy it was just chop it around you want to make sure it's starting to move in the direction you think it's going to go and so he might buy a thousand shares then and if he's profitable he's going to add on a thousand shares and as long as he's profitable each point or whatever his metric is, it goes higher, he's gonna keep adding on and adding on until he gets his full line of 5,000 shares. And then at that point, if he's right and it keeps going, then he's right big with his biggest position. That makes some sense, okay? It does have its problems though. So let's say you buy 1,000, on that breakout or whatever that comes back in you take off a thousand now livermore argues that he could do that over and over again and not go broke and again if you're putting on five thousand to ten thousand shares maybe you could do that three or four or five times or ten times or whatever but i think in theory and practice that's a little bit harder now he's only gonna lose a thousand dollars if he's wrong i'm sorry yeah well let's just say one point It'll probably be a little more than that, but let's just say one point is his uh, stop out in this particular case. He's only going to lose $1,000 every time he's wrong, and then he has the potential to be right big by adding all those shares as it goes. That's one of those in theory and practice things, though. So you could end up with a death of 1,000 cuts, I believe, if you're trying to do some sort of pyramiding like that. So... A proper way to pyramid a profitable position, I would say do not pyramid a profitable position. What you might do is possibly trade around your shares. So let's say you trade a pullback and you put on 200 shares, keep the math easy. You flip out 100 at the initial profit target. The stock rallies, pulls back again. Let's say you put back on 100 shares. So now you're back up to 200 shares and then rinse and repeat, flip out at the next potential profit target. So for instance, here's the SIM trade we took and it pulled back here. It stopped us out right here. We just kind of got nicked out of it, if memory serves. But let's say we didn't get stopped out. You could do an add on here. Let's say we did 400 here, maybe add back 200. But now the price is higher, maybe add back a little bit less. But you could add back some shares and then flip them out again on a swing trade. So that's swing trading around a core position. The market doesn't always give you opportunities like this, but every now and then when you catch catch that tiger by the tail, this longer term trend and then fall a little stock and it keeps going up and then coming down and taking off again, then yeah, you can rinse and repeat. But for the most part, you don't want to be pyramiding, okay? And if you ever do, maybe do a reverse pyramid where you buy, let's say half of your shares, let's say you buy 500 shares and then 400 and 300, 200 and 100, something like that. Now, let me just breeze through the money management real quick because I think Cal may be getting a little lost. The initial profit target needs to be outside of the normal short-term volatility. You can use whatever volatility reading you want. I think you should learn how to eyeball charts, but by all means, certainly use historical volatility at 50-day HV, and that's a good gauge. If it's triple digits, you know this thing is, is jerking around all over the place, could be dangerous to trade. Make sure the structure is there, of course. In this case, the structure is there. You've got accelerated uptrend. It's persistent. You pull it back to the moving average. That's a land you like pullback. There's your one pattern. You're looking for one pattern to trade, one side of the trade. 
That's it. That's all you need, okay? Become successful with that and then start adding in more stuff. But you want to be outside of that normal short-term volatility. If a stock bounces around two or three points a day, then you want to be outside that volatility. Now, on that original trade to withstand the shorter term volatility, I put I my stop was 5.4 points away in this particular case. And I just eyeballed it and I didn't say, oh, I think I need 5.4. What I said was, okay, if this thing comes down to 20 then this position has likely failed. So I want to get out. So whatever that was, a little bit less than 20 in this particular case. And I did the math on that and it comes to 5.4. So that gives you the math on how many shares to buy and how many half is going to be my trending loaf and half is going to be my trading loaf. Now you'll notice when we took the second trade over here, the price of the stock was much, much higher. The volatility had increased. And now it's bouncing around several points a day, more than several points a day. So as crazy as it sounds, it required a 10-point stop. And you know this was a better than a poke in the eye trade. I'll show you. I'll walk you through it in a second. But it went up, it hit it, and came back in. If you were trying to pyramid in this, I think you would end up in a case like this. You would end up in a lot of trouble. And then also we go back to the original trade. Let's say you got in, then got out, then got out, got out, and then you're ready to get back in. It's it's a lot harder to get back in. And sometimes the market doesn't let you back in. Now, this one rallied 20 points the other day. Of course, we were stopped out before it did that. But let's say you were being cute. And I think the day it rallied, it went down the day before. So you're like, oh, you know what? I'm just out of here. Jesse Livermore or whoever says use tight stops you can always get back in well you can't always get back in i think you have to set your stop outside that volatility and where you would obviously be wrong and then let the chips fall where they may now it's really simple because he was asking about profit targets your initial profit target is just your entry plus the entry minus the stop entry minus the stop is how much you're risking on a trade if you go i think you can go to the free section of the members site it's somewhere. I'll put a link in post. But there is a spreadsheet there. It was for members only, but I made it public for everyone else. But I have a tracking sheet that has all these formulas in it. And you just figure out where you want to place your stop and you put your account size in and it does all the calculations for you, which is pretty cool. If I say so myself. Now, when the IPT is hit, we immediately bring that stop up to break even, even if it's intraday. We don't use a trailing stop as a general statement intraday for the same exact reason when I was kind of talking about the prop firms, okay? Because that market could spike up and your stop will spike up and then you get stopped out and then the market takes off without you. It's something wild and crazy like this SIM stock that happens quite often. You get these long tails and then by the end of the day, it might come back in or it might make a long tail and then go straight back up. And if you had that stop in intraday, you would get stopped out of that spike. Now, if you hit the initial profit target, you bring your stop to break even. And then we allow the stop to gradually loosen over time. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So here we hit the initial profit target, and then the stop immediately comes up to break even. That's intraday, okay? Now, this stock was probably bumped. I can go in and look at the archives, or you can look at the archives. It's probably bumped a little bit before it hit that on a day over day basis, but you don't actually get to break even unless you hit that and you actually move that again intraday. Once that happens, you just gradually let it loosen up over time, often by doing nothing. And that's there's no algorithm there, okay? If the stock goes up one point, maybe trail a little bit less than one point. This is after you took your initial profit target. And we're trying to shift gears and go from that swing trader to a trend trader. If you're a pure trend trader, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal. Your accuracy is going to be abysmal. And it's a very difficult way to make money. Not to pick on the turtles, but I think the turtles were in the right place at the right time. Maybe I'm a little jealous. I wish I could have been one of the turtles. But most of the turtles were not successful after the program. And I think that's because 
trend trading, pure trend trading for longer term trends is very difficult. And as I've said quite a bit in the Curtis Facebook, he talks about the fact that halfway through the program, one of the guys did a little calculations, a few little calculations and realized that they were on the verge of easily blowing up because of their share size. And Dennis immediately shut everybody down and brought until they adjusted the share size way down from where they were. So they were really stepping on the gas. And the markets, this were commodity markets back in the 80s, were blowing and going. I think this was in the 80s. And they just happened to be in the right place at the right time. You know, kudos to them for what they did. It's just nothing short of amazing. But it all the markets also helped. In general, you're going to have abysmal drawdowns. And even though they were in great markets, they realized that they could also get wiped out. So that's why I ended up with this. That's why I ended up with this hybrid approach, where I'm trying to transition to that longer-term trade. But if it doesn't work out, then I stop out. So in this case, this was our this was our swing trade loaf right here. We bank a thousand per 100k, and then we stopped out for 2,500. And I think I showed my actual trades here uh, a week ago. If you want to see them in uh, both, yeah, I showed them. In the week of charts, and I also showed them my stock chart shows. But if you go in and look at the week of charts, get my playlist. I'm at Dave Landry. If you go to YouTube, at Dave Landry, take a look at the actual trades. So on the second trade that we went back in, and it's kind of hard going back to the well. I talked all about that last week. But we were able to get that swing trade out. We brought the stop up to break even, and then we scratched out. Now, it doesn't get much more simpler than this now the you might say well day that trailing stop i don't get it well let's say a market goes up a dollar 25 you might just bring your stop up a dollar okay let's say the stock goes up 25 cents a stock like this don't bother moving your stop okay and then you get like what i call stock creep you might be 25 cents and then 20 cents and 10 cents the next day and next day making these new equity highs you just leave it alone. And then let's say it really blows higher. Well, then you kind of look at it like gaining ground. Let's say it goes up three points. Well, let's just bring our stop up two points and thereby opening up. We only bring the stop forward, right? We only go with the trend. We don't move it away from the trend, okay? And as long as the stock's not making new equity highs, you don't do anything. So without getting into all the details here, he does talk a little bit about like two to one and things like that, three times a stop for the IPT. First of all, you don't want to have a fixed profit target for the entire position because you never know when a stock's really going to take off. Every now and then, and it's not that often, but it does occasionally happen, you might catch a 500% move. And obviously, it doesn't happen every day, but you need to position yourself for a possible longer term gains to pay for all of the losses in between. So I would keep it simple instead of trying to pick apart everything he's trying to do. I would tell him, as I'm saying tonight, to don't overcomplicate everything so much. Just keep it really, really simple. Make sure your stops are outside that normal volatility, and that's going to predict your or produce your IPT, get your stop up to break even if you hit it, and then just sit back, relax, I know, haha, -ha, and slowly let things loosen up. Okay. All right, we'll take a look at that, Keith, when we get to the markets. Hey, if you like this video, like it. <laughs> if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. Also, subscribe while you're here. If you want to participate in the Facebook group, you do have to be a member of DaveLander.com. Would love to have you in both. We have a really good group. Everybody here tonight's from Facebook, I see. So hello to you guys. All right, let me shift gears into crypto. And then, uh, Keith, I'll get to that question because I need to pull up the stocks for that. Crypto kind of died out again. It, it, it goes from bull to bear. Like I said, last few weeks, it goes from... 1995, the beginning of the greatest bull market in history to 1999, the end of the greatest bull market in history. Rinse and repeat. Bitcoin's been a bit of a bummer lately. I want to be a bull, but you know what is is we've been below that 30 EMA. And what's my rule for crypto? 
don't buy anything unless it's above the 30 EMA, okay? So right now we're below the 30 EMA. We are finding a little support in here. Not that you wanna make this a trading system, but in general, Bitcoin, especially after big rallies, it tends to get whacked pretty hard, but then come back. It's kind of like a ball being pushed underwater, as I said before. I wouldn't trade on that in and of itself, okay? But it does give you a little hope. But believe me, don't rush out and buy Bitcoin. For me to decide about buying Bitcoin again, it would have to take out the top of its range. What's impressive is a lot of the, the Bitcoin-related stocks and crypto-related stocks have been doing really well. And they pull back, of course, but they seem to be stronger than crypto itself. So I'm wondering if those stocks are saying that crypto, specifically Bitcoin, is going to be okay. Your government does not like crypto and has been coming after crypto. And it's kind of mucked things up a little bit for me. And I think if everybody just paid their taxes, it wouldn't be a problem. So pay your taxes and believe me, they're gonna find out if you don't. But uh, anyway, I don't want to get, I don't want to digress too far. I don't want to agent show to my, <laughs> my door if I start complaining about the government. Uh, I like to look at the strong ones, as I say, each week. And there's not a whole lot that's catching my eye lately. The thing that I also said last week is you've got to keep doing your homework, even though things don't look fantastic, because these markets change really, really quickly. And I, I get a little bored with it. And I, I stopped looking at it and all of a sudden I, I realized I missed a lot of stuff. So take a, make sure you tool through the coins and tokens that you're thinking about trading on a daily basis. Let's take a look at Ethereum real quick and then we'll hop into stocks and then I wanna, the questions are stacking up. So I wanna talk about some of those things. So Ethereum, Ethereum doesn't look as good as Bitcoin. I don't know if I have it in here, but I used to have Ethereum versus Bitcoin. And that's kind of a cool thing to look at. I know you want to party with me. So if you divide Ethereum by Bitcoin, you could see Ethereum not looking so hot compared to Bitcoin, okay? So that's something to keep a look at. Okay, Jeff says, Cal says he was looking back at your old stuff. Might mention that some of it was updated in your last books. So it's not looking at your first books when that had been updated. Yeah, yeah, good point. And um, you know, it's ironic. Somebody, somebody else was was coming back after been being away for a long time, and they were asking me some questions. And and nothing's really changed with me as far as the setups. Like I said, a couple of years back, when I was when Charlie Kirk asked me to be his guest of honor in St. Lucia, which I'm very proud of. That's why I bring it up all the time. <laughs> one of the guys there did a little due diligence on me. And he said, you know, I knew that I wanted to see you because I found a post that was 20 years old, you in a forum and you were discussing bow ties and it's the same exact thing you're doing today. And he was impressed. There's been some little tweaks over the years. For instance, in 1999, the, the best stocks were over 30 bucks a share. And I was doing a lot more short, short term trading and in, and I was holding on some longer term trades every now and then, kind of the same thing I'm doing now. But there was so much stuff moving. There was a lot more churning going on. And the stocks over 30 points were giving me that point move that I was going after. In in more recent times, I'm not so worried about that. And I will buy lower price stocks. We had one, uh, the coal stock was one of our 500% winners, like I talked about earlier. We're from like five bucks and change to 30 bucks or whatever the case may be. So yeah, uh, good point, Jeff. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, the different, the, the, the patterns are the same for the most part, but the markets have changed a little bit and I've adapted with them. And the point I was trying to make is, if you look in my second book, the PDF version, there's a what's changed in there. Now, what's changed was probably written about 15 years ago at least, but most of the what's changed is pretty much the same thing today. So yeah, not a lot has changed. But there are some there are some tweaks. I I and I'm glad you brought that up. That could be a little confusing. So basically you just have to you can't follow me and then go away for 20 years and never follow me again. You have to just keep following along. <laughs> That's the thing is, it's, you know, it, it just, it, it, it kind of makes me nuts 
uh, <laughs> drives me nuts, short trip, is that it's, as soon as we catch a good trend, a lot of people think, well, I got it, and then they're off. It's like, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of there's a lot in between that you need to pay attention to. And if you have more than one set of eyes looking at the charts and reminding you of these things, and it may be a support group like the Facebook group, it, it's, it, it really helps you out a lot because it, it can be a really lonely sport. All of a sudden, something's not working. You think it's broken. You go off to chase rainbows. No, no, no. You might just need to be sitting on your hands a little bit. There's a lot of new stuff here. Landry Light, IPO, 10% system. Well, Landry Light was talked about in, in 10 Best. I don't know when 10 Best was published. 10 Best was probably published 2005, maybe. But yeah. But yeah, there's been some tweaks over the years and there's been some new stuff added in. But for the most part, it's the same stuff. All right, let's take a look at the P's. As you can see, a little bit of a pullback here. I'm really not too worried about that. Like I said and posted in Twitter, and I'm at T following moron, if you're looking for me on Twitter on Twitter. If we take out this this kind of TKO bar high, that's when they downgraded our debts, putting us one step closer to a banana republic. It is what it is. Okay. <sighs> I don't want to get started on that, but anyway, <laughs> I think if we take out this high, so that would be Tuesday's high, I think, the 8-3, what's today? Uh, no, uh, the second, Wednesday's high. So we take out Wednesday's high, was that just yesterday? It seems like a month ago. I think if we take off Wednesday's high, we're going to see some new highs. I, I can't promise you we'll make it all the way to all-time highs, but I think this is a really good test for the market. If we survive the bad news, then the market doesn't care. Right now, the market seems to care a little bit. We did have a little bit of an opening gap reversal, but we didn't end back in black. So that's a little concerning. But yesterday, it's like the whole world's coming unglued. They downgraded our debt. We're getting closer again to Banana Republic. Everybody dumps stocks. And then today, it's like, eh, maybe stocks are okay. We'll see. Now, if you need something to worry about, take a look at bonds. Bonds are a bit of a bummer. Some hedge fund dude came out and said he was heavily short. So that might actually be a good thing. Uh, now everybody and their brother's going to try to squeeze him, I would I would imagine. But what's the line of least resistance right now? Down. Do not catch this falling knife, okay? If we take a look at a weekly chart, looks like we could come down here and tag these old lows. I didn't mean to draw the line there. But anyway, these old lows down here, okay? Jeff says 10 best was written in 2020, 2002. Thank you, Jeff. So where are we now? 32? Oh my God, was that 30 years ago? No, 20, 20, we're in 23. <laughs> it's been a long day. It's been a long week. So that's uh 21 years ago. Wow. Geez. And I think like five, so the, probably like five years later, I did the um what's changed. Anyway, bonds not looking so hot. So that's a bit of a bummer. Bonds down. What what happens when bonds go down? Rates go up. It's an inverse relationship, as you probably know. Um, NASDAQ in general consolidating, pulling back. I'm not going to get too concerned just yet here. So far, so good. I think the um, all the bow ties and all have held. Yeah, so we just came down here and tagged a 30. One thing I was pointing out in Twitter today, I don't know if I put it on Facebook, but we on the queues, we went 70 or 60 something days without touching the EMA. We went all the way from back here, no, right here. Okay, so we went from April, that's four months, all the way to or almost four months to August without touching 60 something trading days without touching the 30 EMA. So that's pretty amazing right there. And, and, you know, over time, a moving average sort of looks like a trailing stop, except that it does keep going higher when price comes down a little bit because it's catching up to price and old prices are being added on, uh, dropped off and new prices are being added on. It's called a drop off effect, right? But anyway, I thought that was pretty impressive. And the last time it did that was way back here in the pandemic. And or coming out of the pandemic, I should say, and you will get some pretty serious corrections in between. And I didn't make my full point, I only had so much to write on Twitter, obviously. But the, the full point is that 
we were due for a correction. We got a correction. We might get more of a correction, but so far, so good as far as the market is concerned. Let's take a look at the Rusties. The Rusty bring up the rear. Well, not really. We tried to get out of this sideways range we've been in, and it came back in. So that's a bit of a bummer. One of you guys was doing, what's the, is it IGV or uh, what's the growth? What's the growth, Russell? IYP, I forget. Y'all did one of those things with the TFM 10% system, and it's just really kicking the kicking the Russell's butt. I think it's the growth segment of the of the Russell. If somebody knows what that is, let me know. And we'll pull it up. Energies are kind of messing around, but they are remaining at the top of their range and just off of all time highs. So for now, let's give them the benefits of the doubt. Drugs are a bit of a bummer. They've come back into their Trading range here. They tried to break out, but they came back in. IYW. Yeah, Jeff, are you are you long that? Yeah. So somebody pointed out that they they took the TFM system, 10% system of IYW, something I never would have thought about. See, that's the beauty of having a group. You know, you guys can tell me what you're up to and and, uh, and show me. It's it's you know, in the past I've had people take my stuff and go out and print money. And it, it used to aggravate me. I felt like, damn, it's like somebody stole my bike off my front porch and drove around the block and then popped a wheelie when they passed my house. <laughs> so, but now I'm like, hey, how'd you do that? That's awesome. Show me how. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll play along with you. I do have, by the way, I do have 100 shares of QQQ, which has worked out okay so far on the TFM 10% system. And that triggered at 319.49. So somewhere in here, it triggered a TFM 10% system. Jeff does not have the IYW, his IWM calls. Cool. What uh, which strike and how far out are you, if you don't mind? I'll take a look at those tomorrow, see if there's anything worthwhile. Biotechnology kind of wide and loose and sideways in here, so that's a bit of a bummer. I like to be a bull in biotech, but right now, it's just not giving me anything to hang my hat on. Manufacturing, decent uptrend there. So far, just consolidating. Also, MNC, material construction. So far, just kind of pulling back in here. So that's encouraging. These are the home builders. What else? Transports have been doing pretty good. The only thing with the transports, as I've been telling my service peeps, is they have lost a little steam. They were kind of accelerating higher. Now they're kind of losing steam and then coming back in. September 185. So, all right, I'll, I'll take a look at those tomorrow. You probably bought them when they were a little cheaper. <laughs> so you have IWM calls or I, the IWM, okay. Yeah, I just wish the Rusty was trending a little bit better. So that's gonna be, I might have a hard time buying those, but yeah, I'll take a look at them, see, if, see what's there. Software looks pretty good so far, just pulling back. Obviously additional weakness would become a, a little bit of concern. We just dipped below the 30, not the end of the world. We had a lot of Landry light in here above that 30, so I'm not getting too excited about that. Semiconductor is one of my favorite areas to watch. The good news here is we're not too far. We're a day or two away from all-time highs, which would be fantastic. The bad news is we have lost a little steam as of late. You can see the net-net price change going back a month or so, or longer than a month, is, is pretty much unchanged. So that's a bit of a bummer. I sure would like to see semis just break out and not look back for quite a while. All right, let's take a look at some of the questions. Okay, let's get back to regular charts. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Okay, EXTR, first setup, missed it. Second setup, missed it. Third setup, maybe this time. Well, you know, my only concern, although it did work out pretty nicely, it did come out of a big base though right here. So this is, even though it's a little wide and loose and kind of funky, this setup here was pretty cool, I have to say. And that's the first pullback after a base breakout. That usually is a pretty good setup. The only problem now is now you're kind of reaching into these all-time highs. And if some of these areas at lower levels begin to catch on with the bull market we seem to be in hopefully that wasn't a a jinx 
but some of these stronger areas could be a source of funds. But yeah, let's just see what the next setup brings. I wouldn't have traded this setup here. The only setup I'm seeing, Keith, is just this one setup here. ZGN. ZGN. Uh, this is a little bit, not super thin. It was a little thin today. It's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. It did take off. It's a relatively new issue, so maybe on a pullback, okay? So let's see if it pulls back maybe to about a little bit about, let's say, 15 and change and take a look at it again then, okay? LPG, LPG on a deeper pullback. Hey, George. Yeah, it looks good. You know, you're coming off of all-time highs, though, and so it could become a source of funds. Maybe there's some energy stocks that that aren't quite at as high levels. I mean, don't get me wrong, as a trend follower, yeah, I mean, a little bit deeper pullback. Then you're kind of coming back to to this consolidation area here. So I'll know it when I see it. But yeah, that's okay. This conceptually correct for sure. But let's see what it looks like on a deeper pullback. Yeah. Okay. Any 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 else? Anything else? Any more picks? I know we talked about talk about stocks all day on Facebook. So you guys are, are out. But uh, by the way, if if uh, this is this show is open to all, if you want to come watch it live, DaveLearner.com slash webinar, bring your questions, bring your thoughts, bring your favorite stock picks. I'll be happy to take a look at them. Okay, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, hit me up at Facebook if you're in the Facebook group. Otherwise, David Dave Landry, Dot com. To those who aren't in the Facebook group, have a fantastic weekend. To you guys and girls, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much, and may the trend be with you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome.